Hello guys and welcome back to the PyTorch basics tutorial and in this video we're going to talk about the last section of tensor operations called reduction operations let's kick things off by giving a definition for a reduction operation a reduction operation on a tensor is an operation that reduces the number of elements contained within the tensor. So far in this series we have learned that tensors are the data structures of deep learning. So our first task is to load our data elements into a tensor. For this reason tensors are super important but ultimately what we're doing with the operations we've been learning about in the series is managing the data elements contained with our tensors. Basically, a reduction operation is just reducing the number of elements contained within a tensor. So this kind of operation performs some kind of uh, uh, arithmetic computation behind the scene or some other kind of operation, but its basic task is just to reduce the number of elements within a tensor. Thus the name reduction operation. Reshaping operation gave us the ability to position our elements along a particular axis. And from a previous video, we have seen that reshaping operations work by reshaping and changing the elements across a particular axis and previously we, we have also seen element-wise operations which allow us to perform operations on elements between two tensors. So if reshaping operations are for positioning our elements along a particular axis and element-wise operations are operations that are performed on corresponding elements between two tensors. Thus, the purpose of reduction operation is to allow us to perform operations on elements within a single tensor. So, the difference between element-wise and reduction operations is that element-wise operations need at least two tensors uh, for them to be used and a reduction operation just works with a single tensor. So tensors give us the ability to manage our data. So that's why we say that tensors are our basic data structure in PyTorch because they enable us to use the different kinds of operations to manage our data. Next, let's see a reduction operation example. Suppose we have the following 3x3 three three rank 2 tensor. Uh, we're going to define a tensor called T, and it's a 3x3 three three rank 2 tensor. Let's look at our first reduction operation, which is a summation. When we call the reduction operation, dot sum method. Notice that we are not passing anything inside because a reduction operation only works on a single tensor. It basically sums all of the elements inside the tensor and gives us the result as a single number. That's why a reduction operation is called an operation that reduces the number of elements within a tensor. Using the fact that the numL function uh, gives us the number of elements within a tensor. For, so in this case for the tensor T we have 9 because we have 9 elements. If we uh, use the sum function first and then the numL function next then we see that the output will be 1 
which means if we call the sum method, then we get a tensor which contains the element 8, which is the sum of all of the elements. And if we call the NAML function after the sum function, then we get the number of elements within this tensor is 1. So we can see the difference between the number of elements between the original tensor and after the reduction operation. We can see that the number of elements after the sum operation is less than the number of elements of the original tensor and we can do this by using the element-wise comparison operator and this returns true because 1 is less than 9. The sum of our tensor's scalar components is calculated using the sum tensor method. The result of this call is a scalar valued tensor. So whenever we call the sum operation the output will always be a scalar valued tensor if we don't pass any kind of arguments here. Checking the number of elements in the original tensor against the, re the result of the sum call, we can see that indeed the tensor returned by the call to sum contains fewer elements than the original. So whenever we perform a reduction operation such as the sum operation, the number of elements of the output will always be less than the original tensor. Since the number of elements have been reduced by the operation, we can conclude that the sum method is a reduction operation. As you may expect, here are some other common reduction functions. Uh, we have already seen the sum operation. Uh, there is also the product reduction operation. And when we multiply all of the elements of tensor T, the output will be zero. Uh, there are also other kinds of reduction operations such as the mean and standard deviation. Uh, this will be very essential as we move on on to the later sections of the tutorial when we start computing the mean and standard deviation. And now that we have seen that mean and standard deviation are reduction operations, they compute the mean and standard deviation of a tensor and they output a single element tensor. All of these tensor methods reduce the tensor to a single element scalar valued tensor by operating on all the tensor's elements. Notice that uh, we have outputted only a single element up to now. And reduction operations in general allow us to compute aggregate or total values across data structures. In our case, our structures are tensors. Here is a question though. Do reduction operations always reduce to a tensor with a single element? The answer is no. In fact, we often reduce specific axes at a time. This process is important. It's just like we saw with reshaping when we aimed to flatten the image tensors within a batch while still maintaining the batch axis. If you don't pass any kind of arguments within a reduction operation such as the sum or product, then you can get a single element, but if you pass the parameter dim, such as the one that we did previously when we did reshaping operations along a certain axis, then you can get more than one element as the output. So let's see how to reduce tensors by axes. To reduce a tensor with respect to a specific axis, we use the same methods and we just pass a value for the dimension parameter. Uh, this is the one that I have mentioned previously, the dim uh, parameter. Let's see this in action. Suppose we have the following tensor and it's a 
3x4 tensor, uh, rank 2 tensor, having different lengths for the two axes will help us understand these reduced operations because the number of elements for the first axis is 3 and we have 4 for the second axis. Let's consider the sum method again. Only this time we will specify a dimension to reduce. We have two axes, so we'll do both. So when we provide the dim parameter as zero, then we get this kind of output. So uh, depending on the original tensor, dim is equal to zero is going to perform the sum operation along the first axis. And when performing the sum operation along the axis, we sum the elements across the column, uh, across the first dimension. So we're going to sum 1, 2, and 3, which is 6, and we do the same for all of the columns. That's why we get the number 6 when we pass the parameter dim is equal to 0. And for the second example, we get 4, 8, and 12. This means we're performing the sum operation across the first axis, which means across the rows. Uh, when we sum the elements across the rows, we get 4 and 8 and 12. When I first saw this, uh, when I was learning how this works, I was confused. If you're confused like I was, I highly recommend you try to understand what is happening here before going forward. Uh, just take a pause and try to understand how the summation operation is uh, working along an axis. Remember, we are reducing this tensor across the first axis and elements running along the first axis are arrays and the elements running along the second axis are numbers. Uh, this is basically saying that the, the elements that we come across when we go along the first axis, which is the rows, are arrays and the elements that we encounter when going along the second axis are numbers. We will tackle the first axis first. When taking the summation of the first axis, we are summing the elements of the first axis. So uh, let's see this in detail. So if we access, if we try to access the first row, then we get uh, a tensor of ones. Then if we access the second row, then we get a tensor of twos. And uh, we can do the same in order to get the third row. So the summation operation, reduction operation by using the first axis is basically taking the sum of t0, t1, and t2, which means it's adding the corresponding elements of the rows. Surprise here, because we have covered in, the, in a previous video about element-wise operations, which are also in play here. When we sum across the first axis, we are taking the summation of all the elements of the first axis. To do this, we must utilize element-wise addition. This is why we covered element-wise operations before reduction operations in the series. We are adding the corresponding elements from each row when we are adding uh, these different tensors. So basically the summation operation along the first axis where dim is equal to 1 is just adding the elements across the rows in corresponding positions. The second axis in this tensor contains that common groups of 4. Since we have 3 groups of 4 numbers, we get 3 sums. 
So t0 dot sum means taking the sum of the first row and we get 4. Uh, we also do this for the second row and the third row. Here we get that the sum is 4, 8 and 12 and basically if you take the sum of the original tensor which holds all of the rows and pass d is equal to 1 as a parameter it's basically taking the sum of each row and then giving you the output. This may take a little bit of time to sink in. If it does, don't worry, you can do it. Now, with this heavy lifting out of the way, let's look now a very common reduction operation used in neural network programming called argmax. Argmax is a mathematical function that tells us which argument when supplied to a function as input results in the function's max output value. Argmax returns the index location of the maximum value inside a tensor. So basically, let's remove the arg part and uh, discuss about max. Max is another function within PyTorch which returns the maximum element of a tensor. And when you add the arg part, then you create a new function called argmax which basically returns the index location of the maximum value inside a tensor instead of just returning the value, the maximum value of that tensor. When we call the argmax method on a tensor, the tensor is, uh, is reduced to a new tensor that contains an index value indicating where the max value is inside the tensor. Argmax is also a reduction operation because it's basically selecting the maximum element from the tensor and since the element, the number of elements of the output are already less than the input, argmax is considered to be a reduction operation. Next, let's see this in code. Suppose we have the following tensor again. It's the same as the, the one before and Oh, I think this one is a different tensor since we are doing a different experiment. In this tensor, uh, we can see that the max value is 5 in the last position of the last ray. So, if someone basically asks you to find the maximum element of this tensor, for a human it's very easy to find that element. But how is PyTorch finding the maximum element under the hood when we use the max function or the argmax function? Suppose we are tensor walkers. To arrive at this element, we walk down the first axis until we reach the last ray element. So basically one method that you can use is to basically access each row one by one and then walk down to the end of this ray passing by the four and the two zeros and once you reach the last row then you can uh, you can pass four and the two zeros and arrive at your destination so let's see some code and use the reduction operation to get the maximum element so as i told you before the max function returns the maximum element of the tensor but the argmax function is returning the index of the maximum element but this number 11 doesn't make sense when you when you approach it first but what is happening is if we flatten the original tensor into a one-dimensional tensor then the 11 makes sense because number 5 will be basically the 11th ele um, the 12th element but on index 11 that's why we get the output 11 so the first piece of code confirms for us that the max is indeed 5 but the call to the argmax method tells us that the 5 is sitting at index 11 so what is happening here We'll have a look at the flattened output of this tensor and if we don't uh, if we don't have specific axis 
or specify specific access to the argmax method, it returns the index location of the max value from the flattened tensor, which in this case is indeed 11. Let's see how we can work with specific axes now. We have already mentioned that reduction operations not only return a scalar value, but they also can return higher dimensional tensors. In order to do that, we need to access specific axes, and we provide the dim parameter again for the reduction operation max and argmax. Now, uh, we're trying to get the maximum element for across the columns, so on axis 0. And here, the output will be 4, 3, 3, and 5, because we're getting the maximum element in each column, or in dim equal to 0 on axis 0. This is axis 0, and this is axis 1. And when we provide dim is equal to 1, then we are trying to find the maximum element in each row. So in this case, we have 2 for the first row and 3 for the second row. Since we have two threes, then we can just select the first one. And for the last one, we have 5. And argmax basically returns the index position for these numbers. Remember when you use the, the max method, uh, you can also get the index positions besides the elements themselves. If it is a scalar value, it doesn't provide you with the index position, but if it is a higher dimensional tensor, it also gives you the index position of each element. And this output is the same as when you call the argmax method. We are working with both axes of this tensor in this code. Notice how the call to the max method returns two tensors. The first tensor contains the max values and the second tensor contains the index locations of the maximum values. This is what argmax gives. So the argmax output is the same as the output that we get from the max method. For the first axis, the max values are 4, 3, 3, and 5. These values are determined by taking the element-wise maximum across each array running across the first axis. For each of these maximum values, the argmax method tells us which element along the first axis where the value lives. So the 4 lives at index 2 of the first axis. So here we are, when we provide dim is equal to 0 as an argument to argmax, it's basically going on the first axis and it's selecting the, the maximum element across each column. So 4 is on index 2 of the first axis and the first 3 lives at index 1 of the first axis. The second 3 lives at index 1 of the first axis and the 5 lives at index 2 of the first axis. Here we have 4, 3, 3, and 5, which are the maximum elements across each row, and this is the index position. And here, when we go across each row, we get 2, 3, and 5, uh, which are basically 3, 1, and 3 index positions. And here, when we decide between these two 3s, since they are the same, we take the index of the first 3.
For the second axis, uh, this is basically what I have explained in the previous slide. Uh, 2, 3, and 5 will be the maximum values in each row when we consider the second axis or axis equal to 1. These values are determined by taking the maximum inside each array of the first axis. And we have three groups of four, which gives us three maximum values. Since we have three rows across the first axis, uh, we can take the maximum elements. The argmax values here tells the index inside each respective array where the maximum value lives. In practice, we often use the argmax function on a network's output prediction tensor to determine which category has the highest pr prediction value. The last type of common operation that we need for tensors is the ability to access data from within a tensor. Let's look at these for PyTorch. Suppose we have the following tensor, which is a 3 by 3 rank 2 tensor, and we perform the reduction operation mean and this basically calculates the mean of this tensor. So first it sums all the elements inside this tensor and takes the average. Now we're using a new tensor method known as item and in the previous video I have briefly mentioned the item method but we consider it as one of the most important operations in uh, when, de when dealing with tensors, so that's why uh, we just have to mention it and uh, try to give some explanation before we move forward. So when we call mean on the 3x3 three three tensor, the reduced output is a scalar valued tensor 5. If we want to actually get the value as a number, we use item tensor method. This works for scalar valued tensors. Remember that whenever you use operations element wise or reduction operations on a tensor, you get the tensor object as an output. This is a tensor object which holds the value 5. But if you want to actually access the value which is stored inside the tensor object, then you can you, you can call the item method. Congrats for making it this far in the series. All of these tensor operations are pretty raw and low level. But having a strong understanding of them makes our lives much easier as we develop as neural network programmers. We're ready now to start the next part of the series where we will be putting all of this knowledge to use. Finally, let's see the implementation of the reduction operations before we wrap up this section. So reduction operations in general allow us to compute or aggregate total values across data structures. And first uh, let's see the implementation of the reduction operations uh, using this sample tensor. Uh, first, we're going to import torch and we're going to define a 3x3 three three tensor. All of these tensor methods reduce the tensor to a single element scalar value tensor by operating on all the tensor's elements. So the first uh, reduction operation is sum and this will give us the sum of all of the elements inside the tensor. The second is product. As its name suggests, it's going to multiply all of the elements inside the tensor and give us an output. Next is the mean. This uh, reduction operation takes the sum of all of the elements and give us the average of these values. <coughs> 
Finally, we have the standard deviation, and we need to use std method to get the, st the standard deviation of this tensor. We can reduce specific axes at a time. Notice that we are just getting a scalar output from each of these reduction operations, but we can get higher dimensional tensors as an output from a tensor a tensor's reduction operation by using specific axes at a time. So now, instead of doing the sum of all of the elements, we can take this way, we can get the sum of each row or maybe uh, each column uh, by using dim is equal to zero, by adding the, which adds the elements across the first axis. And as we can see, we can get the sum of each element across the column and this is axis 0 so it's going to add 0 2 and 0 and we get a 2 and it basically does the same thing for the second and third column next uh, we're going to pass dim is equal to 1 as parameter and this is going to add the elements in each row this is axis 1 so it's going to add 0, 1, and 0 for the first row, and we get a 1. And it basically does the same thing for the remaining elements. Finally, uh, we have argmax reduction operation. argmax returns the index location of the maximum value inside a tensor. So in order to demonstrate this reduction operation, we're going to define another tensor. Uh, which is a 3 by 4 rank 2 tensor. Before we see the argmax reduction operation, uh, let's use the max method to get the maximum element from this tensor. As, uh, as the output shows, 5 is the maximum element of this tensor. Next, uh, we're going to use argmax to get the index or the location of the maximum element for this tensor. Remember that it gets the index location by first flattening the original tensor and getting the index position. And it might not make sense if you just consider the original tensor. Let's see what's happening uh, behind the scenes by using t dot flatten method. Here you can see that five is since it's by a three by four tensor, the number of elements is twelve, and five will be the last element which is located on index eleven because indexing begins with index 0. Notice that we are getting the argmax and the max are uh, giving us a scalar output, but we can do this for a specific axis, just like the previous sum and product reduction operations. By specifying the dimension instead of taking the maximum of the whole tensor, it's going to find the maximum of the elements across each column for axis 0, because this is axis 0 and this is axis 1. And here we have 4, 3, 3, and 5 as the maximum elements and if it is a higher dimensional tensor the max function is also going to give us the indexes for each of the maximum elements but we can just get the index positions by using the argmax method and passing dim is equal to zero as an argument this basically gives us the index positions only and we can also get the maximum elements on axis 1, which means in each row. So the maximum elements are 
2, 3, and 5. When you have elements with the same values, then you basically consider the first one as the maximum. That's why we have 2, 3, and 5, and 3, 1, 3 as index positions. If you're confused where which 3 am I using here, then the index tells you that you're using the 1 on index 1. And we can just extract the indexes by using the argmax function. The final operation is how to get the elements from the tensor object. And for this demonstration, we're going to use a new tensor, which is a 3x3 tensor. The t.mean method returns the mean as a tensor object, as we have seen before. But we let's uh, say that we want the value 5 and we do not need the tensor object. We can do this easily by using the dot item method. Now we're getting the value 5 instead of the tensor object. This is for a scalar value, but when you define dim is equal to 0, this will, this will find the mean along the first axis of the tensor. As we have seen before, it's going to basically find the mean across each column. And notice here that this, this is not a scalar value, but a list. So since it is a list, we cannot use the dot item method in order to just extract the list and not the tensor object. Instead of using the dot item method, we replace the dot item by using the to list method. This will convert the tensor into a list. Now we can see that we're just getting the list and not the tensor object. One remaining function is the dot numpy method, which will convert the tensor to a numpy array. So this is not a numpy, uh, a numpy scalar or a numpy array. This is just basically a Python list, but sometimes you just want a numpy array and not a list. In order to do that, instead of using the toList method, you have to use a dot numpy method. Notice here that this is a numpy array and not a Python list. And the data type is float32 because we have a floating point after each number. This was, this was all about the tensor operations. Starting from the next video, we're going to start uh, looking at different kinds of methods. And we're going to use and utilize all of these tensor operations together with the new techniques that we're going to learn in order to build models such as linear regression and logistic regression. Audio jump.